Election Day was more like a festival. There were parades, farmers markets, music, rum, a lot of rum punch, and cakes. People would bake election cakes, they were called, and they would bring them to the polls and share with neighbors. And I said, this is such a lovely tradition. Let's try to restart it. That is the voice of A.J. Jacobs, an experimenter, researcher, writer, and generally just a curious person. And he is urging Americans to make Election Day fun again, like the way they did when the nation was young. Election Day back then was a party and people were making sure that they celebrated the fact that they got to vote for the people who were going to govern them, which was new and a novel idea back in those days. And one way that AJ would like to bring back this festive feeling is for all of us to bake an election cake or pie, doesn't matter, right? Cake or pie. And share it with your fellow Americans at a poll on Election Day. Let's do start that. Not actually let's start. Let's restart that tradition. I think that would be fantastic. Now, AJ is the author of The Year of Living Constitutionally, One Man's Humble Quest to Follow the Constitution's Original Meaning. And it's a follow up to his wonderful book, The Year of Living Biblically. Or, or, or any of his other great books, like A Thousand Thanks, Sir, It's All Relative. All great uh, and fun reads, Tim. All great and fun reads. Yeah, good good point. Uh, we wanted to speak with him about his experience of living for a year, replicating 18th century life in colonial America. And we also wanted to hear from him about what he learned about the Constitution, how it was created, and what the authors of the Constitution were trying to accomplish. And did wearing non-elastic socks and a tricone hat make a difference in the way that he looked at the world? <laughs> did using a quill pen and an inkwell influence the way that he wrote this book? Mm, AJ talked a lot about epistemic humility, this idea that acknowledges that we don't know everything and how critical it is and how it critical it was to many of the founding fathers that em embraced this idea. They didn't know it all, and they were really good at saying so. AJ challenges us to consider being a bit more like them in that way. Yeah, and you and I both know that we don't know much at all. So I think we're, we're there. But we're because there. of the fact, because of that fact that the Constitution, at least as AJ understands the, the founders thinking about it, that it wasn't perfect. He also challenges us to think about the U.S. Constitution as a living document, as a document to be updated, to reflect the times, the way that the original authors thought that it should be, which is why we have amendments, right? And mm -hmm. he does it all with a smile on his face and an enthusiastic attitude for making our world a better place. <music> Welcome to Behavioral Grooves, the podcast that explores our human condition. I'm Kurt. And I'm Tim Houlihan. And we're releasing this conversation with A.J. Jacobs right before the U.S. elections, primarily to get our American listeners to think more about voting and the importance of living in a democracy. Now, that said, in 2024, there are more than 60 countries around the world that are hosting major elections. So even if you live outside the United States, this episode might be of interest to you. Yeah, and we're doing it also to really push election cakes, whether you're in the United States <laughs> or any other country, just make an election cake and let's do it. All right. So with that, we also talked with him about his gratitude for modern conveniences, such as elastic in our socks and hot showers. And of course, all of this comes from AJ's remarkable and amazing experimental mindset. That is something that we can learn from his work and to think experimentally and to put ourselves in experimental situation. It's a great learning tool. So with that, Groovers, we invite you to sit back and relax with a slice of election rum cake and enjoy our conversation with A.J. Jacobs. AJ Jacobs, welcome back to Behavioral Grooves. I am delighted to be here. <laughs> We're delighted to have you. <laughs> Ab absolutely. And of course, we have to start with a speed round. So I'm going to start with, if you could choose one, would you prefer to live by the beach or in the mountains? 
I would say a beach. Uh, I am a fan of assuming the beach is warm. You didn't say that. <laughs> I it did could not. be the, yeah. the, the beach in Alaska, but I am a fan of warm <laughs> weather. So assuming that that is the case, I'm going to go with beach. Is there a problem with beaches in Alaska? I have I have no moral problem with them. Uh, I just uh, <laughs> am a fan of, I think my... My internal thermostat was set high, uh, so I, you know, I get cold when it's seventy-eight degrees. Oh my gosh! <laughs> yeah, it's a problem. Yeah, you you would not not do well in Minnesota where I live. Then there there that's oh that's yeah, I know, yeah. I know, I am. Yeah, maybe I'd get used to it. I don't know how how much uh, you can change your internal thermostat. I don't uh, know. That's a good question for you scientists. <laughs> okay. On the next episode of Behavioral Grooves, <laughs> um, right now, we need to find out whether if you had a superpower for an hour, what superpower would you choose? Oh, that's interesting. All right. Let me think about that for one second. Uh, and just an hour, because I've thought about it for life, but nope. the hour. Yeah. Uh, yes. Well, hmm, uh, I guess, well, I'm trying to think, do I want to go with something that would benefit me or benefit society. So that's the way I'm thinking. Like, yeah. And yep. if I could benefit society, because well, I always think when you have a superpower, like Santa Claus has a superpower, he can deliver all those presents in a single night. And yet he's, what about medication? Why yeah. is he focusing on <laughs> right. Nintendo products and not, you know, <laughs> delivering... So I guess, yeah, maybe maybe it would be super speed, and I would alert the authorities beforehand. What do you need delivered around the world? Like, are there any organs that I can bring across the world uh, with my new superpower? I, so, that is the best answer I think we have had for that <laughs> seriously? question. Seriously? Well, most know. people, it's like, yes, do I get flying yeah. or being invisible? Because I want, you know, flying is really fun and, you know, all of those things. So I think, yeah, I mean, thinking about beyond yourself, fantastic. I mean, being a superhero would be a, a really not a fun thing if, because like, whenever I watch, when I watch Superman the movie and he goes on a date with Lois Lane, and I'm like, but wait, you're in that time. You could be saving people. You could be. Uh, so it is a really morally fraught uh, life ha being a superhero if you take it seriously. Oh my God. Who, who sounds would like ever my mother's like, voice? Like a date costs, you know, 200 lives, right? This is like, oh, exactly. I have two hours on an evening date. Well, that's worth 250 <sighs> lives or 300. It's worth it, right? Or maybe not, right? It's like, it was, yeah, oh that's right. Yeah. While you're screwing around at the Daily Planet writing those stupid stories. Exactly. Yeah. Why the lies? Why the uh, all of that? <laughs> okay. Well, it is. All yeah. right. We, we, this is a speed round. We could go on for, for days on, <laughs> on these. All right. Yes or no. Would you actually like to be transported back in time to meet with James Madison or Alexander Hamilton to ask them about what they were thinking when they were writing the Constitution? Oh, absolutely. I would, as long as I don't stay there. That would, <laughs> oh, I want this an is hour. the hour. You get an hour with them in yeah. the bag. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Not, because, you know, it was a horrible time. It was, you know, yeah. cutting edge medicine was, was considered, the uh, tobacco enema was considered <laughs> where you literally blew smoke up someone's butt to cure all sorts of ailments. That was cutting edge medicine. I don't want to go back to the 18th century. It was racist, sexist on top of that. But, yeah. but yes, of course, I would love to go and talk to them for an hour. <laughs> for an hour. Okay. Okay. Last speed round question. Will you be making an election cake for this November for the 2024 election in the U.S.? Absolutely. And uh, if we have time, I'd love to talk about how other people can join the movement to try to reframe democracy as a joyful act. And uh, and a sweet one where you can actually make cakes and enjoy democracy with uh, with sugar. <laughs> <laughs> we will definitely get to that. We will we will definitely come back to that. It is good to have you back on Behavioral Grooves. Uh, thanks for joining us. So we've introduced your book in the lead up to our conversation here. So 
But tell us what was the biggest surprise that you got out of your year of living in the mindset of the colonialists? Great question. Well, I would say there were there were two types of surprises. One, surprises about what was in the Constitution, and then surprises about the lifestyle and the good and bad of the lifestyle. Well, let's start. Let's start with the Constitution. What what was surprising about the Constitution? Well, one thing is, I was I had been taught as a kid. It was almost. Um, handed down uh, by the gods, and it was this perfect document. But of course it's not. It was written by humans, and it's got some amazing, inspiring, wonderful parts, but it's also got parts mm -hmm. that are super problematic, and it's it's got typos. I guess they weren't <laughs> called typos then. They were quillos, but the word Pennsylvania <laughs> is spelled two different ways within four pages. Uh, so P-E-N-N -N and P-E-N-S. And the founders knew it was an imperfect document. George Washington said to his nephew, wrote to his nephew, this is an imperfect document. It's up to future generations to improve it. So that was um, that was sort of a, a, a real surprise that and a realization that we can work with it. It's a great roadmap. It's uh, at its best, the parts about liberty and equality and equal protection under the law, wonderful. But it is, uh, it is just that. It's a roadmap. We need to work to improve it. Yeah. All right. So what about then the second insight, not about the Constitution itself, but about the times and, and the world that was going on, I think you were talking about? Right. Well, I would say there were, there were wonderful parts about it and horrible parts about it. So one, I'll give you one quick example of each. A wonderful part about it is I wrote the book as much as I could, not all of it, with a quill pen, an actual <laughs> quill and ink pen. And uh, there was something amazing about writing offline, writing and thinking offline, because I wasn't constantly distracted by the dings and chimes and baldness cure ads that I usually get. And I could actually, I think that it made me, I hope, a, a more nuanced thinker because I was actually able to concentrate for a few hours. And I do, I don't think we all need to go back to quill pens, but, but pens or pencils or even just getting one of those software apps that will cut you from the internet for six hours or two hours. That I think is very important because it, it does change the way you think. We need to think and talk more offline. So that's one advantage of 18th century living. A disadvantage is just, it made me realize how much we take for granted, which we kind of talk, sorry, I have to take a sip of my, my grog. <laughs> <laughs> but not not an 18th or a 19th century grog this is this is 20th century yes. grog that you're drinking water yeah uh, <laughs> but it made me grateful i'll just give you one tiny example that uh is tiny on purpose which is i tried to really get into it so i was wearing the clothes i had the tricorn hat i had the breeches and i wore these stockings that they had and the stockings were they had no elastic so they would fall down to your ankle so every morning and i had to put on little sock belts they weren't even garters they were pre-garters they were little belts you had to sock and the amount of time that i spent putting on sock belts i'll never get back those combined hours so and that's you know there's dishwashers that there's uh, you know, modern medicine. There is so much that we take for granted. We have a lot of problems now, but I, I think we, um, when you see how difficult life was then, it's inspiring because you realize progress is possible and, and we still have a long way to go, but we shouldn't say, oh, this is the worst time ever. No, it was, we, we have problems now, but I do not want to go back to the past. It's it's interesting as you say that because there's an aspect of this. There's a couple of things. A, the writing piece that you talked about. There's really good research out there that shows that our brains actually slow down. Uh, we are better able to put 
uh, thoughts together and to have all of our thinking be more clear when we use our hands to write as opposed mm. to typing on a, on a machine. There's a, there's some really cool research on that. Maybe we'll talk about it in the grooving session a little bit more. But then this, this other aspect that you talk about, just the amount of work that people had to do to do the daily things that we take for granted. And part of that, it's interesting, as you talked about it, it got me thinking, wow, maybe we have too much time on our hands that allows us this time to, ooh, the other side is so evil when, in fact, in the past, we didn't have the time to even contemplate that. And maybe that's part of this polarization that the world has come into is just because it's too easy. We got we got too much time on our hands to to form out these, you know, inconceivable, you know, manifestations of what the other side is doing as opposed to putting on our socks with sock belts. Yeah. <laughs> well, that is a fascinating possibility. I would say the ideal would be we have more free time, but instead of using it to write nasty social media posts about the other, we re we use it to have coffee with someone of a different perspective, or we, we uh, read a book that looks at uh, topic with nuance. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't think the solution would be to go back to um, stockings, but uh, but I, it's a very interesting <laughs> hypothesis that that, <laughs> that is contributing. We have too much time to trash. Yeah, I was being a little facetious there, but yes, I think there's some, there's, there, there is some elements that if we could shift that free time to a more productive, more right. cooperative area. I think that would be fantastic. Exactly. You know, AJ, we look at these books as being, uh, and I'm, I'm referring to not just the year of living constitutionally, but the year of living biblically, uh, collectively, and just think about these are massive behavior change initiatives on your part, right? They're like very intentional, very prescriptive about what you would do and wouldn't do. And I'm kind of curious from this behavior change perspective, what what kind of halo did you have? How how have have those those experiences of living in that change affected you going forward? Oh, yeah, in big ways. And I think we talked about this previously, but I, I think it does bear repeating because it's one of the main themes of all of my books is the idea of how much behavior changes your mind, how the outer affects the inner, the exterior yeah. affects the interior. And um, so when I will force myself, like with a book, I wrote a book on gratitude yeah. about coffee, which we talked about last time, uh, where I thanked yeah. a thousand people who had anything to do with my morning cup of coffee around the world. Yeah. And the I so I was forced behaviorally to write these notes or meet with people and thank them, even though I didn't feel it at first. But my mind would catch up with, I wake up in a default Larry David annoyed mood <laughs> and force myself <laughs> to thank people. And I would eventually, the mind would uh -huh. catch up. And I think you know much, much better than I do, but there is a lot of research on how behavior affects your your mind and it's part of cognitive behavioral therapy and uh and i love the phrase which apparently was coined in the 19th century by a minister who says it's easier to act your way into a new way of thinking than to think your way into a new way of acting so it has had a halo effect in many ways from i think i'm more grateful i think i'm more outgoing. I think that I might be a default introvert, but I've sort of moved towards wow. the middle, towards extroversion, because I think there are positives to that. So yeah, it definitely has had a lasting halo effect, as you say. So looking back at the, the, the recent book that you did, This Year of Living Constitutionally, obviously you had to study the Constitution, you had to study the amendments and various different things. But you also looked at like the world in which these people were operating. What would you want our listeners to understand about how politics was either different or the same versus today? What were there aspects of it that you go very different? Um, and then were there things that were, hey, maybe they haven't changed that much? Well, I mean, human nature, I think there are some elements that are hard to change, but I do think they had a, v a very different perspective. I think they were much more 
balanced in their thoughts about rights and responsibilities. I think we live in a society where we are very focused on individual rights. It's all about individual rights. And I love individual rights. They are hugely important. But I think that we focus on them slightly too much at the expense of responsibilities. So back then, the idea is, yes, we have rights, but we also have a responsibility. We, we have to be in the bucket brigade or to put out fires. We have to join the local militia. I don't want to restart a militia, but I do think uh, whatever it is, maybe it's national public service. Everyone has to spend six months teaching in AmeriCorps. Something like that would bind us together and remind us of our responsibility. You know, there's the JFK quote, ask not what your country can do for you, what can you do for your country? And I think that if a politician said that today, people would roll their eyes and say, that's not my, that's not my problem. And substitute community or town or school or, or world for country. I think that's a mindset that is that we've lost a bit and that needs to be recaptured. Yeah, that that's that's so beautifully said. One of the other themes that really struck us in the book was that of epistemic humility. Oh, yes. And can you spend a minute just telling us about why you think that that's so important? Well, uh, you've done wonderful work on this on your show, so I encourage people to listen to past episodes. <laughs> but I am a huge fan of epistemic humility, and I think that the founders had more of it than current day politicians or society. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Ben Franklin, he said at the convention, he said, the older I get, the less certain I am of my own opinions. And he told a wonderful story, a little parable at the Constitutional Convention. He said, there was this French lady and she said to her sister, she said, it's so strange, sister. Why is it that I'm the only person I've ever met who is correct on every single issue. And <laughs> so his point, of course, is we're the French lady. And so he was basically aware of biases uh, way before Daniel Kahneman. He was really, um, you know, a pioneer in that. And in his autobiography, he has a wonderful advice where he says, when you're in a discussion with someone, don't use words like certainly or undoubtedly. Use words like, it seems to me, or unless I am mistaken, or that kind of phrase, you will get much farther in your discussion, and you're much more likely to, to change the other person's mind if you use phrases like that, as opposed to having this epistemic arrogance that you are uh, right on every single issue. Yeah. Well, you have mentioned in the past that Ben Franklin is your favorite founding father. Now, you might have mentioned it in an element of the essay he wrote about, you know, fart proudly um, <laughs> as opposed to this. But but why? I mean, you just mentioned some really interesting pieces about how Ben was uh, thinking differently than others. What other aspects about uh, Ben Franklin make him one of your favorite founding fathers? Uh, yeah. And just to address the fart proudly very quickly, I don't want to take your podcast uh, into the gut, but he did write it. He wrote, he was a founding father, and it was actually a very interesting essay because it was semi-humorous, but it was about science. Can science make the world better? Because his argument was, is there a scientific cure, uh, some sort of potion or drug that we could take to make our flatulence smell better. It smells like <laughs> lavender or roses. <laughs> and nowadays, I think with gene splicing and CRISPR, I bet that we could come up with something that would actually solve that. <laughs> so I love that. I love his experimental mindset. Yeah. He was always, he was so curious. And there's a great story. When he was in his 80s, he was coming back from Europe for the last time in his 80s. And he was on the ship and uh, he took advantage of that voyage, which couldn't have been pleasant, but he was right. He has a notebook where he wrote notes about um, how wind affects it. He took a bottle and he dropped it with string way down deep to see is the water colder at the bottom or is it warmer at the bottom? So he was fully curious and experimental right up until 
uh, the end of his life. He was just amazing. Yeah, I, I think about those those voyages. I also read about he was he knew he he understood that that oil on water would <laughs> would uh, dissipate the um, the the surface friction, right? And so he was trying to ameliorate the waves by dumping barrels of oil in front of the boat. Oh. I mean, just incredibly, you know, incredibly. F- you know, bright guy. Probably not great for the environment, but he didn't know that. He didn't <laughs> yeah. know. We'll give no, him a break. He, he didn't know. Um, I would like to just change over for just a minute. We want to talk about your experimental living newsletter. Uh, we want to encourage listeners to to subscribe because it's fantastic. Thank uh, you, both Tim. Kurt and I are subscribers, and we just we just love it. But you recently wrote an article, actually two, uh, that was called uh, "The Ten Strong Suggestions for Surviving the Age of Misinformation." So can you just share a couple of key things that you felt like that we can do to to deal with and survive our age of misinformation? Of course, I would be honored. And just to give you a quick background, I actually started a book that was all about the misinformation, disinformation crisis. Oh. And the idea was I was going to fact check everything in my life from whether the world is round to whether my wife loves me. And I still, (laughs) she says she does, but I'm I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I would, um, I would say I, I, I have put that on hold. It was because it it is a fascinating, but it's also overwhelming. But um, I thought I would put out sort of 10, I didn't call them commandments, as you mentioned, because part of what I think is a problem is absolutist thinking, black and white thinking, and commandment sort of implies. So these are strong suggestions that inevitably will have uh, exceptions. But uh, yeah, let me give you two. One is the way I like to have discussions with people who I who with whom I disagree is not a debate. I don't know if a debate is always the best uh, because you try to trounce the other guy with your facts and statistics. That rarely convinces them to change their mind. In fact, they may polarize and get defensive. So instead, try approaching the conversation as a, a puzzle, a puzzle that you can solve together. Uh, and puzzle, the questions include what do we actually believe? Why do we believe what we believe? That's a huge one. Yeah. What evidence could the other person present to us that might change our mind? Because if there is no evidence that will change your mind, that's a problem. And and, and at the end, if if we still disagree about X or Y, are there productive ways to go forward? Are there things we do agree about that we can take action and make both of our lives and the world better. So that would be one example. Another that you recently had on uh, a guest talking about probabilistic thinking. I am a big fan of that. And I try to give percentages to my beliefs whenever I can. You know, I am, for instance, I am 99.999% sure that evolution is true, but I'm only, you know, I'm 70% sure that say coffee is good for my health. I've seen I've seen a lot of studies that say it right. is, but I've seen right. some that say it isn't. So right. uh, that I think helps and even in daily life, which I may go overboard, but when my wife says, "What time will you be home?" I say, "Well, there's a 70% chance I'll be home at 6:30, <laughs> but a 30% chance I'll be home at 7:30." I I find that useful because that way if I said I'll be home at 6.30 and I'm not, then she might be annoyed. I think she's annoyed just because I gave her the <laughs> Because you give the percentage. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, may not, it may not be practical, but yeah. I think more people need to start um, speaking uh, in percentages. AJ, it's, it's, it's something that Tim and I have talked about. Actually, we, we heard about this first, yeah. I think, from Annie Duke, a guest of ours. Oh, who, yes, yes. Um, who, who wrote a wonderful book called Thinking in Bets, and we re- reference it all the time. But there is an aspect aspect of actually doing this in our daily lives that helps in, I think, a number of different ways. Tim and I have had these conversations where we're working on a problem or doing something and you go, I'm 80% sure of this. And 
Tim will go, I'm about 70% sure. And then you can work through to increase that or decrease that. And the other mm -hmm. piece about that, and again, we're talking to the choir here, is that now I don't have black and white beliefs around those things. That now if I hear some evidence that contradicts what I believe, it's not a kind of a negative aspect of my self-identity. I, I, mm. It's like, oh, I can now adjust my 99.999% aspect to 99.8%, okay? And that helps me in this, even if it's a strongly held belief, it's not a personal attack. It is now just more information. And I, that I'll is so good. There. I love I love that framing. Yeah, it makes it easier to change your mind. I'm, I'm just repeating what you said because yeah, it is. It's not a matter of uh, of your ego being shat. You're not tied up in this being absolutely true. It's just a hypothesis, and uh, and that is, I think, a much better way to go through the world and much more pleasant too. Yeah, it's yeah. You know, it is otherwise. Every time you hear something that challenges your beliefs, you get that um, cortisol going and you're like, ah. but if you're a little more, if your goal is the truth instead of uh, identity protection, then I think that that is, uh, it, you'll be happier because you will be more. And, and I love when there are communities where changing your mind due to evidence, not changing your mind willy-nilly, but changing your mind due to evidence is is seen as a badge of honor uh, and or even correcting yourself later is seen as something good as opposed to something to be embarrassed about. Hey, this is Kurt, and we want to say thanks for listening to Behavioral Grooves, and we hope that you're enjoying this episode, but it feels a little bit one-sided. You're hearing from us, but we're not hearing from you. This is Tim, and we have two suggestions to remedy that. The first is join our Facebook page and engage with us. We want to talk with you. We want to hear your perspectives, and hopefully our Facebook page might be the place to have some of that interaction. So please, please come and join us. The other recommendation we have for you is to leave us a quick rating. You know, the little five-star thing at the bottom of your app? or a short review. Just leave us a few words about what you like about behavioral groups. We very much appreciate it. Thanks, and we now return you to our regularly scheduled programming. We are talking with A.J. Jacobs about his latest book, The Year of Living Constitutionally. And uh, A.J., I wanted to ask about a fair amount of the book is really inquiry into the U.S. Constitution as we understand the original meanings of the document, right? What was in the minds of the framers? And I wanted to know, what does originalism mean to you? Well, I mean, it's interesting. I think it, it touches a lot on this epistemic arrogance and humility that we've been talking about. Because just to quickly define it, originalism is a way of interpreting the Constitution, which has become very powerful and influential. Recently, five of the nine justices on the Supreme Court are originalists of some flavor. And originalism argues that the most important part in interpreting the Constitution is what did the words mean at the time they were ratified? So in 1789, what did those words mean? And uh, yeah, so just to make it more... Uh, uh, more specific, here's an example of how it can play out. It, the 14th Amendment was ratified after the Civil War. So if you are a true originalist, then you want to figure out what did the words equal protection under the law and due process, which are in the 14th Amendment, what did those mean in the 1860s when it was ratified? And there is a lot of ev contemporary evidence that they were that 14th Amendment was about black men and protecting black men. They were not thinking about gay people or gay rights or gay marriage or women. They were thinking of a much more specific. So if you are a hardcore originalist like Th Clarence Thomas, for instance, he would argue the 14th Amendment does not apply to gender or sex. And even he would Say, and he would also say probably not gay marriage. So the decision that 
called Obergefell, where gay marriage was ruled constitutionally protected because we are all, all deserve equal protection under the law. An originalist, hardcore originalist like Clarence Thomas would say, no, the 14th Amendment does not protect gay marriage. Gay marriage is not constitutionally protected. So it's a very different way of looking at the world. I, as part of my quest to be epistemically humble, I tried to present both sides, originalism and the other side is often called living constitutionalism or pragmatism that says we have to evolve the meaning. And I tried to present both sides so that I wouldn't be accused of doing a hatchet job. But in the end, I do think the arguments for some sort of uh, looking at the original meaning as part of your decision, but also looking at how it will affect society now, how a, a sort of um, a more not just past focused, but present and future, past, present and future, taking all of those into account when you uh, interpret the Constitution. It's amazing to me when we think about how that plays out, right? And the impact that that has on everything today, not everything, but many things in, in our world today you can go to Brown versus the uh, Board of Education and looking at segregation um, as part of that. And really, if you were a originalist, that probably doesn't play out really well in that from that perspective. I think there's a lot of those aspects I think are really interesting. Oh, and just to just to to steel man the originalist side, yep. most originalists would say that the originalism allows for Brown versus Board of Education, but many liberal scholars would agree with you that it does not. Yeah. Just throwing that out there. There you go. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for doing that, right? <laughs> there is an aspect, though, of when we think about the Constitution, one of the things that I think you explored is like, who wrote it, right? And we understand from the scholars, right? And correct me if I'm wrong here, James Madison Alexander Hamilton were a couple of the the big authors of the Constitution and particularly, you know, the Bill of Rights as it comes out of that. So is the Constitution the work of just a few people or was there this larger encompassing element around that from from what you've researched? Well, that's a great question. I, I guess I would say both, but let me explain. Okay. Uh, and uh I think that you talk in your show, you've done uh, the importance of framing, of uh, how framing a situation can make a radical difference. And I think the same applies to the Constitution. I'm not talking about the literal frame, the titanium frame around <laughs> yeah. the Constitution. That's another story. But this is, I'll give you an example from history of how this can be so influential. Uh, before the Civil War, uh, there were two great abolitionists. There was William Lloyd Garrison and Frederick Douglass. William Lloyd Garrison, a white man, he argued the Constitution is a pact with the devil. Mm. He said this is because it condoned slavery or allowed it. And he said it deserves to be burned. And he literally would burn copies of the Constitution on stage. So he was a real showman. Frederick Douglass, a, a former enslaved man who became a great thinker and writer and orator, and originally he agreed in the uh, with well, that is a pact with the devil. But sometime in the 1850s, he changed his mind, and Frederick Douglass said, instead of saying that, let's see the Constitution as a promissory note. That's mm -hmm. the phrase he used. That. It promises these wonderful things like liberty and equal protection, and yet it doesn't. America is not living up to that. So let's look at it as a, a, almost a, um, a a document that we have to aspire to the highest ideals, and that framing has been incredibly influential. Martin Luther King called the Constitution a promissory note. Obama talked about it in similar ways. And I love that. So that that's all about framing. Like, do you focus on the troublesome parts of the Constitution, of which there are many? Or do you look and say, what are the higher ideals 
that even the founders did not live up to, but that we can continue to try and make a more perfect nation. So I guess that, uh, I forget even the question, but that is my, that's the way I look at the uh, Constitution nowadays. To what degree were your experiences or, the, or your thought process around that, that issue, this idea that the Constitution is a promissory note, it's a, a living document, not just some fixed thing enshrined and then needs to be rewritten when things go bad. How much of that was influenced by your experience of the year of living biblically? of looking at a document that's, you know, 2,500, 3,500 years old in some cases. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this, I mean, it, this book, The Year of Living Constitutionally, I see as a, a semi-sequel to The Year of Living Biblically because it is touching on a lot of the same themes as how literally should we take the words of this uh, sacred text ha and and I think the Constitution is sort of the sacred document of our civil religion. And, and I, I mm. am uh, in the camp of, you know, we've got to evolve the meaning. And, and also, there's a phrase, cherry picking, which has a, <laughs> a, a very negative connotation. Uh, but it doesn't have to be negative. I, if you pick the sweet cherries instead of the rotten ones, then I think it's a better world. Uh, <laughs> the problem is sometimes people cherry pick the parts in the Bible about how homosexuality is a sin, you know, so you can focus on the, some very negative parts. But if you are cherry picking in a good way, then I think that's the only way to approach these documents. Okay. At the beginning of the episode, we talked about election cakes. Oh, yes. Let's go back to election cakes. First, can you just tell our listeners what are election cakes? And then tell us about what you're trying to do with these election cakes. Well, thank <laughs> you, Kurt. Yes. So as part of this book, I actually tried to do everything I could to be in the 18th century. And so I voted when I went to, to the polls for instance, I voted with my voice because they didn't have secret ballots back then. So I just announced for governor, I would, and they said, no, you can't say it out loud. You can't say it out loud. Uh, so I am glad that that doesn't exist anymore. I'm glad, of course, that women and people of color can vote. So we don't want to go back to the 18th century voting. But there was one aspect that I love that I think deserves resurfacing. And that was for those who were privileged enough to vote. It was an amazing new right. It was, oh my goodness, we can choose our elected leaders. And it was almost a fest. Election day was more like a festival. There were parades, farmers markets, music, rum, a lot of rum punch, and cakes. People would bake election cakes, they were called, and they would bring them to the polls and share with neighbors. And I said, this is such a lovely tradition. Let's try to restart it. So I, uh, I went on Facebook, which I know is not 18th century. My, <laughs> my argument is it is one of the older platforms. So <laughs> maybe it's okay. And I got people in all 50 states of the United States including some territories, to bake election cakes and bring them either to the polls or to their work or, or just with family. And the idea was to remind people that democracy is sweet. That was sort of our yes. catchphrase, to, to cherish this right. And I say it's not going to solve the problems of democracy. I call it a, a gateway carb because <laughs> it'll, hopefully it'll get people excited about voting and then we can also solve things like gerrymandering and other problems. But the idea was to get, and there are studies that when you present elections in a more festive manner, more people actually come out to vote. Australia has what they call the democracy sausage. So election day becomes this big barbecue. And uh, uh, so I loved it. And I also, I'll, I'll end there with one other, one other f thing, which was the original recipe for election cake was sort of figs and cloves, sort of like, you know, fruit cake at Christmas. <laughs> Not everyone's taste. So I encourage people, if they want, they can do that. And some did, but people updated it in creative ways and they decorated it according to their state. So there were, you know, the 
the peach, uh, the Georgia cake had peach and, and people put state flags on it. It was just wonderful. And uh, I'm doing it again this coming November. And so if anyone would like to bake a cake, we, we post it all over social media and it is a very, I at least find it a very lovely and emotional time. So yeah, please, you can get to it through my Substack, which uh, Kurt and Tim were nice enough to mention, Experimental Living, or or on my website. So yeah, I would love the more democracy bakers, the better. Yeah, we'll we'll make sure we have links in the show notes to all of those. So we encourage listeners, please go out, do it. AJ, I do have to ask a, a question though. Is it okay to have an election pie instead of an election <laughs> cake? Because I know my my mother-in-law doesn't like cake, but loves pies. So, and my kid, same, followed along with grandma. So is that okay? I think... I think the American way would be to say, absolutely. I think, you know, there's freedom of joy, freedom of expression, all that. So please, yeah, it could be election, uh, whatever. It could be election candy, could be election eclairs, who knows, whatever you want. Anything to remind people that uh, of this right and that we should cherish it. So as part of this embracing of the 18th century lifestyle, AJ, did you also get into, I mean, you were you, like you were doing... Um, battle reenactments in addition to making sure you had exactly the right kind of wool coats and the right kind of tricorn hat, uh, tricorn hat and all those sorts of things. What about music? Did you get it all? Did, did you dig it all into the, uh, the kind of music that they were listening to at the time the Constitution was written? I did a little, a little. I First of all, I, I bought a fife and I, bought, I took some fife lessons <laughs> from a fife instructor who was a, a and I will say, I don't recommend the fife as like a, a fun home instrument because <laughs> it was actually designed for the battlefield oh. to signal retreat or attack. So it's incredibly piercing and shrill. And my wife is like, this is so unpleasant. So, uh, <laughs> well, it had to compete with the drums. So right, the drums it had and to be the loud. gunfire. The gunfire. Yeah. It had. Uh, I also. One thing I loved about 18th century music, I did hold uh, a dinner party where we cooked 18th century food, beef stew with a lot of cloves. They love cloves, as I mentioned. But we also sang songs because that was part of the entertainment. And I liked that it was so active and interactive mm -hmm. yeah, because, you know, you couldn't. You couldn't put on the radio or, or Spotify. You know, if you wanted music, you had to make it. And so we sang some songs. We sang Yankee Doodle, which the original version is actually has some very dark passages about Yank, uh, all the, the casualties in the Revolutionary War and how oh, <laughs> Yankee ouch. Doodle was, was uh, yeah, it was like digging graves. So it's not all the happy-go-lucky version, but I found it moving and also... Um, yeah, fun. So there was a little, but do you know, there are people who know much more than me about 18th century music. Are you a fan? No, uh, no. <laughs> That's a short story. No, no. Um, but I, I do know that, I mean, it was a, in the world of classical music, it was a highly transitional period. You know, it was sort of the the development of the the uh, romantics. You know, uh, ah, Beethoven right. was coming into his own and that sort of thing. So there was um, that was happening in Europe mostly. Okay, but we're not going to go there. Uh, well, I did. I also did some dancing, uh, some 18th century dancing, yeah. which was was sort of the uh, precursor to line and square dancing. So all again, it had a very communal feel to it which uh which i liked uh you know everyone and i was terrible at it but people were very forgiving i when i was with the reenactor community <laughs> one of the things they do is these uh these dances and uh but they are they're nice to beginners like me all right so so aj do you still have your tricorn hat do you still have of course not yeah. just one i have two or three hold on <laughs> two or three i thought you kind of got rid of the the ones that were kind of crappy oh look, oh, at, that. look at that this oh, is one of my gonna... better one wait do i have it on right no i don't there it is um oh, yeah go. no yeah. i love it i'm a big fan well i got rid of i got rid of the one that i bought off amazon but these I bought a few from actual haberdashers that, uh, and people in the, in the reenactment community who actually take pride in making them. And that was another nice thing about 
uh, 18th century life was the whole DIY craftsmanship yeah. and, and love of, uh, you know, it really makes you a little more connected to the objects in your life. Is it ever worn with, a, so it's called a tricorn because it creates three corners by rolling up part of the brim, right? Right, Do, right. Is it ever worn with the brim down? I have never seen that. It could be. It okay. could be. I think they are sewed together, so so not as much. But I will, I mean, I was told one thing is if you should, you'd, you wear it a little cocked, not quite straight on, because you want oh. one area, one side flat, so that when you bring your musket up really quickly, it doesn't knock your hat off. Ah. So that's an important detail for pro anyone tips. who wants it's a pro tip <laughs> for all future tricorn wearers. Yeah. It's a very AJ, important. So you, you, you had this year where you embraced this lifestyle. You took on all of these different things. What one lesson would you impart to our listeners or a couple lessons if you can't find one that you would want them to know or to understand based upon yeah. what you've done? Well, I think we've we've talked about a couple of them. So let me just repeat them because I love them so much. One is the idea of epistemic humility. Another is the idea of of gratitude for elastic socks and democracy. <laughs> uh, one thing that I do love was the experimental mindset, which we touched on with Ben Franklin, but uh, I think it bears repeating because they really did see this as an experiment, uh, the American experiment. They saw themselves as scientists. And so, wow. and the important part of science is it's experimental and sometimes things go, sometimes things work and, and sometimes you have to adjust and change. And one book I loved reading was James Madison's notes on the Constitutional Convention, where he wrote down all the, the debates. And what I love about it is that it reveals just how fluid that process was, how many different ideas. Uh, because again, we're sort of taught this is the way this was handed down. Mm -hmm. But if a couple of delegates had voted differently, we would have three presidents instead of one president. That was a big uh, debate. A lot of delegates said, we don't want a single president. That's like a, we just fought a war to get rid of King George. What are we doing? Or if a few delegates had voted differently, we might have a, a, a one-year president, a new president every year. So all of these things were very fluid. And, and I think that in government and in life, having this experimental mindset would benefit us more uh, I, you want some stability. You don't want everything to be in flux, but you do want to have this mindset that not these things are not always set in stone. Let's experiment and try to make it better. AJ Jacobs, thanks so much for being a guest on Behavioral Grooves. That's that's just fantastic. Well, I loved it, and I love the message you are putting out into the world. So glad to be a small part of it. Welcome to our grooving session where Tim and I share ideas on what we learned from our discussion with AJ, have a free flowing conversation and groove on whatever else comes into our election cake stuffed brains. How, you know, I have been thinking about this. I like that, by the way, because I you I'm like it every time you just say that I do. you eat half of them and then I, you just say, yeah, you like it. But why, why should I say that I hate half of them when I could say I like them? So. <laughs> That's my question. No. So Katie and I have been talking about making an election cake. Yeah. Aaron and I have. Aaron, and we've, we, Aaron loved this idea. Aaron is my wife for folks who don't know this. Katie is Tim's wife. Mm -hmm. We actually are, have sent out notes to our friends. I think Aaron has even posted on Facebook this idea of everybody should be making election cakes and have yeah. a party. Where do we, you know what I didn't ask AJ though is does it, do you have to have it outside of like 50 feet of the election, you know, the polling <laughs> I think, place? I think if you have the vote Harris or vote Trump on the cake, then yeah, then, probably. Yeah, yeah. But, but if, if you just had vote, you know, I think that would be OK inside of the election polling uh, yeah. area. Yeah. OK. Yeah. 
I just, I, I want to, I don't want to ruffle people's feathers and get them. Like, I think that there's a lot of edgy nerves going into this election. And I don't want people to be weirded out by Katie and I bringing a cake that we're going to cut up and, you know, give to people who show up and want to vote. So your meta perceptions on this, your perceptions yes. of the other side thinking that you're... Yes. Yeah, there you that go. I'm an Don't idiot. let that bother you. Yes. Yeah, I've, I've got to get over that. All right. Uh, what did you, what, what, where do you want to start this grooving session, Kurt? Uh, there's this idea that responsibility and participation in our government in the form of government service, this idea that AJ brought up that everyone could serve, yeah. is a really interesting piece. Besides election cakes, of course, that was really cool. But this idea <laughs> that we don't have that, right? I mean, the military and, and the percentage of people who are in the military, when we look at the overall population of the United States or most of any country now is so small. But mm -hmm. there are these other ways that we could have a community, a, a service aspect that you are giving back to your country, right? I think especially of the contrast between what it was like during World War II and the United States drafted indiscriminately, that there were very few people that got out of the draft. And I'm thinking of men specifically, right? But but during World War II, pretty much if you got drafted, you were going to serve. Now, you might not serve in a forward position, but you served. Now, I think that changed by the time we get to Vietnam in the 1960s. When there was a, there were a lot more deferments, and if you were clever or had a, a you know, a, a wealthy family, that you could pretty much make sure that you you didn't have to serve in in the military. And it was a much smaller percentage of, yeah. of folks at that time. We didn't have you know the multiple millions of soldiers that were engaged in in that. So right, but the consequence of what it was like to come out of World War II that if you were in the service, it was a an egalitarian leveling thing that no matter how much money you made or what side of the street you lived on or what religion you were, if you served, you were in service to the government and helping defeat something evil. And that was really good. And and for the country as a whole, it, it helped us believe in something big, some yeah. kind of superordinate goal of we're we're helping the country. And and I love AJ's idea because that didn't happen with Vietnam. That was that was just a smaller portion. Yeah, he was going back to right at the founding. People had served in militias. They fought against the British. And right. there was this communal aspect of that. And, and it goes back to this idea, you know, that, hey, I might disagree with you wholeheartedly on the issue that you are taking, mm -hmm. but I have a warm feeling for you that you are a good person because we have shared this experience and we have right. Right. You know, this oftentimes horrific experience and not saying that we need to create horrific experiences for people to go through. Right? <laughs> thank you, thank exactly you for don't want that. that. That's thank not you. my, my point <laughs> here. My point is that this shared bonding experience is a way to help overcome some of the effective polarization that mm -hmm. we have in, in our world today. And it could be done through service in the, with a, sort of a capital S rather than military service. It could right. be done, it, right? He said, as AJ Teach kind America, of said, you know, the idea right. of, uh, you know, helping out in some sort of way in your community, that, that this could be a national way of doing it. Now, yeah. I think it would be really hard to get across in the United States, but if we could, it would be very cool, right? There's this idea that it would help overcome some of the negative pieces of today. Because it might actually help coalesce a national identity that if everybody did it, not just those people or them or us, if it's all of us, if everybody does it, I feel like there could be something really wonderful. I, I, I noticed mm -hmm. something, I was, I was talking to a guy who, who was at, the, um, at West Point. Yeah. And he said that when he was a cadet at West Point, he said that, 
those cadets are under strict rules to not be partisan. Yeah. They're under strict rules to not show partisan beliefs because that's not a part of the job. The job is to defend the Constitution and, 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 the, and the country, yeah. not to be partisan, not to join a political party. The, it's the Constitution, which is really interesting when the oath of office for the president, but also for military, it's defend the Constitution from all threats, you know, yeah. uh, foreign and domestic. And that is a really interesting piece. And this idea that you talked about, yeah. a national identity, it is an aspect that we don't necessarily have today. But if everybody was to have gone through some sort of service year, that it it's not going to be a silver bullet and take away no, all of our no. issues that we're facing. But it could be one piece of a larger puzzle that really helps in making that that case. Right. So I agree. I agree. And again, no deferments because you're rich or because right. you're whatever that you have to find some way to serve with others who are not like you. That's the big thing, too. <sighs> Okay. We've just what solved, else? What else, Tim? It, we just made a big, big problem solve right there, Kurt. I think that yeah, that was just it just felt right, so we're good. Done. To, we're done. That's it. All right, folks. <laughs> we can. We've just solved all of the United States and maybe the world's problem. There we go. And that brings us to epistemic humility. <laughs> <laughs> Great segue right there from saying, hey, we have all the answers to, oh, wait, maybe we don't. We kind of have to get away from this idea that that we know everything. Like our knowledge is always incomplete and it can change based on new evidence that the founding fathers had epistemic humility. They knew they were aware. They wrote about it. They talked about it. They didn't know everything. They were doing the best they could. Right. But. And scientific communities live by it. Scientific communities live by, we're not sure. Let's go test it. Yeah. Let's, let's find out whether this is going to work or not. Let's, let's develop, let's do science. Right. And I think we could all do better by just trying out some epistemic humility in our own lives. Bayesian thinking, thinking in probabilities or thinking in bets, as Annie Duke says. Yeah. Again, yeah. glad we don't pay her royalties. This idea that we, shouldn't ever be a hundred percent certain that even when we're really, really sure we should be having that scientific, you know, doubt that it's 99.9.9%. Yeah. But then if there's additional information that comes in, I need to readjust my thinking. I need to readjust my beliefs. And with that comes a much greater ability to face reality as reality is and not be so ingrained in our self-identity of this is how it is. And my intuition, as we talked about in a previous episode, is always right that right. no, this is not the case that we need to actually look at things through a very different lens. Yeah, it reminds me of David Dunning of the Dunning-Kruger effect comment where he said that if you're going to express an as expert opinion, you actually have to be an expert. <laughs> like, <laughs> wait, I am an expert. I looked something up on Google and I spent five minutes researching that yeah, I mean, idea but to that say, other people had researched for years and years and years. <laughs> right. And because you spent six and a half seconds typing in and reading then now you're not an expert right we're not so let's let i just want to say let's let's get on board with with some epistemic humility one of the things that i love about aj in our previous and every conversation that we've had with him every we've time had, we talk we've had to few him. that weren't even recorded we just had conversations with him is this gratitude that he has Mm. With the work that he's done, this the from beginning with the year of living biblically to uh, a thousand, a, a thousand thanks, things, a thousand, yeah, right. All of this, this he he exudes. That's the right word, right? Exudes yeah. gratitude, and I loved like he was just like, you know how how freaking wonderful elastic socks are. I mean <laughs> right. that. I mean, right. think about that. Think about mm -hmm. if we put on socks every day and I had to wear sock belts and to put those yeah. on every single day. Yeah. Or so I, I was thinking about 
how do we how do people get around now not you didn't have to walk everywhere there were horses and carriages they'd been around for hundreds of thousands of years so not hundreds it, of thousands of years carriages have not been around for hundreds of thousands tens of, years. of thousands of years how about that carriages maybe a thousand even years. tens of thousands of years. maybe a hundred years okay so <laughs> if you go <laughs> at some point in history we didn't have to walk everywhere yes, and, yes. there you go and, and yet, if you're going to, so I grew up with horses. And if yeah. you're going to go and you're going to ride your horse, first of all, you have to get the horse in from wherever the horse is, you know, into the barn, because th that's where you're going to do this work. Then you have to, you have to groom the horse. You have to, you know, get dirt and junk off the horse in order to put the saddle on. And this, and then you have to saddle the horse. And, and this process takes 10 or 15 minutes. So it's not like you're just going to go out to the car and press the start button and just go. You you actually have to do a little bit of a process just before you even start your commute. And then with the horse, you're going to commuting at like 10 miles an hour. Yeah. Life was really, really different. Now, there's, I'm not going to riff on all the benefits that AJ talks about, which I think are great. But I think that we have to think about are there just good reasons to be grateful for being able to just do all the things that we do? I think about, I actually think about this more than probably I should, right? This idea of we don't appreciate the small things. The I, the fact that I can take a hot shower <laughs> at any point during the day, that right. did not happen a right. hundred years ago. Like in 1924, you were very lucky if you had somewhere yep. that had uh, hot water that was showerable, right? It was not guaranteed, yeah. You, this idea of being able to, if I can afford it, hop on a plane and fly anywhere, anywhere almost in the world, I can do that. Yeah. This idea, that th those are big kind of things, but even things like I can have a cup of coffee that's cold and I can put it in this little machine called a microwave and in 20 <laughs> seconds it can be piping hot. Yeah, that's cool. Those are things like we we don't think about yeah. that. I don't yeah. think about the fact that I don't have to wash my clothes by hand. I can put them in this machine, pour a little detergent in and bam, they are clean. They smell nice and they get dried, not hanging them up. I don't have to put these pins on. I just take a whole bunch of wet clothes, throw them in this other thing machine and they get dried in 30 minutes. You know, bing, done. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It, it, life is good. So Groovers, I want to ask you this. What can you think of that you might be grateful of that mm -hmm. you're not living like people in 1789 had to live when the Constitution was being written? Just Take a moment. We'll let you think about it. What were you great? What are you grateful for that you live in today's world as opposed to that world? Write your comments on our Facebook page. Oh, I love <laughs> that, Tim. There we go. We'll have to go and put that out there. One last pitch for the election cake. Just make an election cake. Make make voting fun. Celebrate the day. That's what I want. Here's here's the other thing. If you make an election cake, take a picture of it, post it on our Facebook page. There we go. We'll we'll put all the all the Facebook uh, election cake pictures out there. We'll we, we will join AJ in this movement of election cakes. And you know, as Tim and I have our political beliefs, I don't care what your political beliefs are. I I just want you to participate yeah. in our democracy and go out and vote. So go out there and make your choice. Do your research. Don't let other people's opinions sway yours from our political polarization piece. Do your own research. Look, don't look at the research, the, the news sources that you always look at. Look at different ones and go out and vote. If you live in one of those 60 plus countries that have democratic elections between now and the end of the year, please do your duty. Be a participant and have some fun with it. Make yeah. a damn election cake. Make a damn election cake. Yeah. And particularly, if, you know, if you're one of our listeners in another country and you're doing this, we definitely want that picture. We want the yeah. we want the other pictures of the election cakes across that aren't just in the U.S. We want those. So, OK, wrap it up, Tim. Yes. Yes. Let, okay. Let's do that. All I know is this, Tim. 
if I'm going to pull an AJ Jacobs and do a year of living one way or another, my year is not going to be set way back in history. Oh. I am not going back <laughs> in this world without elastic socks or hot showers or any of that. Okay. Well, that's a whole nother conversation. And I we would talk agree. about that. Actually, we yeah. have this conversation with AJ, in one of yeah. our groove jams, which uh, might be out now. I don't know, depending upon when this is, uh, episode gets, gets launched. So, yes. Um, we should remind listeners that AJ's experimental mindset is really what puts all of these remarkable observations into, into motion, right? Without that spark of the idea, then and a remarkable amount of research and a tremendous amount of follow through. He might never have really gotten to see this tremendous opportunity that there is for national public service program or any of his ideas. So I just right. want to sort of be grateful for AJ. And that got us thinking about a lot of things. And we were very lucky to record a Groove Jams with AJ yes. about this question, what would you change about the Constitution? So, folks, be on the lookout for that Groove Jams, because I have to tell you, you thought this episode was fun? That episode was really, really fun. Super fun. And it's in video. Yeah. Uh, because if you're not familiar, Groove Jams is our new experimental bonus episodes where we ask a guest a single question that Kurt and I just sit down and we groove on with that person. So just have it's a conversation like three, with them. We just free flow. We groove, man. We jam. We three buddies we, having a beer. Yeah, well, we we sometimes have a beer, but not, not yeah, yeah, but not no. in this case. <laughs> All right, they are a lot of fun and a bit different than our traditional model, and we hope that you listen in, and we hope that this episode gets you thinking about how you might use some epistemic humility this week to go out and find your groove. <laughs>